Dr. Mix. Hi, and welcome to the podcast number five from Dr. Mix, where we discuss how to mix vocals. So we've been doing quite well with this podcast. We get tons of um, good feedback. That's fantastic. How have you been, Aaron? I've been great. How have you been? Yeah, not too bad. Very, very busy, as you know very well. How about you, Dom? Oh, very busy as well. I've been producing some great music the past two weeks. And there's also the MPX show this Friday and Saturday. So um, we're going to be pretty busy. Have a nice workshop there with Yamaha. So it's going to be really cool. Yeah. yeah, I actually can't wait. We always get to meet amazing people. Yeah, that's really a lot of fun. Vocals. This is another monster subject, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Pretty huge. <laughs> so I would say, you know what we can do? Why don't we just dive straight into it? Yes, how to mix vocals. Let's start with the basics, the preparation. And as ever, we ask Aaron, what do you do to prepare vocals for mixing? Well... As with the other important elements of bass and kick, we set up a parallel compression chain with the uh, bus, so that's ready to go. So how about filtering the low end? Uh, what do you do in that department? Yeah, we usually take a uh, filter so that we can filter away any low end thumps that may have got onto the recording by any sort of means. Less than ideal circumstances they were recorded in. I have a question straight for Dom. How do we know how much to cut that low end? Because I mean, we're talking about the vocals and, you know, it's arguably a very important part of the song. Well, it's, it's not much argument, it's very important. So, I mean, what do you do to make sure that we don't cut too much? Uh, well, there are two ways. I mean, first of all, you can look at a spectrum analyzer and see where, you know, the meat of the vocals is and just try and cut there. But I think the safest way is to start cutting with, you know, with a um, high-pass filter. Cut all the way while the mix is playing and see where it starts to get thin and when you are actually missing a part of the vocals. So I think that's the safest way because when you're listening to the vocals in isolation, then you might be, okay, I don't want to cut too much. But when you're playing in the context of the mix, you actually find that you can cut a lot more and actually they sound cleaner. Also, it depends on the genre. So if you are doing, I don't know, like uh, house music or EDM, then you might need to cut a lot more because you need the vocals to be very thin and so that they sit in the mix very nicely. You know, you don't always need this low end like you want in a ballad, for example. Right, that's quite right. And can you give us some numbers here? Uh, I mean, I would say the safe cutoff point would be 75, 80 hertz, you know, for male vocals, for, you know, for female vocals, it could be up to 120, sometimes even 150, if there's a very, you know, ethereal vocal line, like a soprano or something. Yes, exactly. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is compression, because of course, compression is one of the most hard to understand things. So with vocals, one aspect of compression is we need to understand all of the lyrics. So we need something that levels it. And part of this is achieved while recording a lot of times. The typical chain for recording vocals would be a nice 1073 Neve, and then you would have an 1176 compressor. What that does, it allows the high peaks of the singer screaming a bit too much during the chorus <laughs> and maybe not loud enough during the verses. What that does is takes care of business to begin with. So maybe you don't want to be too drastic on that. Maybe, I don't know, two, three dBs at most within 1176 going into the recording. Now, as, as always, compression is better done in stages. So once we have it in the system, we already have it pretty much tamed which is, you know, a good idea. I mean, of course, if it's jazz or, you know, classical music, stuff that requires huge jumps of dynamic, then maybe you might not want to compress as much. But generally speaking, for commercial music, a little bit of taming right from the beginning is a good idea. What that does, it allows us to understand all the words and make sure that the level of the vocals is consistent and it doesn't drown too much during passages of the music. The other aspect of compression for vocals is the sound. Now, 
of course, different compressors can give different sounds and they can also contribute that sense of saturation and they can color the sound. So rather than thinking correction, we think let's have a sound that's consistent with the message of the song. Now, what are the typical vocal compressors are and for vocals? Probably the main one is the LA2A, which gives the vocals a very nice, fat, warm, round sound, which is very, very common on sort of pop records, ballads, softer music. On something more aggressive, like say rock or metal, an 1176 can often be used because that will not only peg, but it will add some distortion into the um, vocal character. And also the Distressor, which is one of those compressors that it's a bit like an army knife, Swiss army knife. Mm -hmm. It can do different sounds, which is great. And also it's got different levels of uh, distortion that you can apply to the sound in proportion to how, how much compression you're getting. But of course, it's not all about the 1176, the LA-2A and, and the Distressors. Do you have any other compression choices, Dom? Well, I would say before we even get to the compression stage, we should check the material very thoroughly and see if our singer is very dynamic. Because if they're extremely dynamic, and there are many singers that are like that, your best bet is to try and even the level of the vocals before you even get to the compressor, because if he is super dynamic, then the compressor will react really erratically. So, you know, clip gain or automation, depending on what uh, DAW you're using, try to level it and then you go to the compressor and then you can be more creative and make, you know, a sound out of the compressor. Now, I think, hmm, of course, my favorite is LA-2A, hands down. But I would also say sometimes love the Neve uh, 33609, which is gives a very nice smooth uh, compression and, you know, it makes the vocals immediately when you turn it on, even without you compressing, it sounds smooth. One of the characteristics of the 33609 by Neve is that it was built for the radio initially. So it's got that sort of leveling amplifier vibe, which means it will tend to keep the level constant without really giving it too much artifact or without you even noticing too much. You know, the 33609, mm. like the LA-2A, I have to say, they are great at, you know, compressing the sound without being heard. I mean, they still give yeah. a sound and uh, probably the LA-2A, when driven very hard, has a particularly nice sound. If you distort it, then it's great, actually. In fact, the album Elefunk from the White Stripes, mm -hmm, yeah, I believe mm -hmm. that they used a saturated LA-2A to get that incredible sound of vocals. Speaking of compressors that you can't actually hear, uh, I have another favorite, which is the TubeTech CL-1B, which is really nice. Even, you know, you know, the hardware, even the plugin is really nice, but I mean, the hardware is really, really gives you such a great tone and you can compress like 15 dBs and you can't barely hear it, but it's so nice and compact. Yeah. Uh, well, if, if, if you pull that out, then I am going to say the Thermionic Culture Phoenix, which is... Um, mm. ooh, yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, of course, there is something with tube gear. And in fact, that's why we have a valve option on our, um, on our mixing and mastering service. I mean, as always, you can get some really nice saturation out of it, or it can be the most transparent thing on the planet. It depends on how you want to use it. I mean, in general, tube can be very flattering if used correctly. So let's talk about another aspect of the vocals, which is the sibilance and the S's. Now, Aaron, how do we address that problem? Yeah, uh, we use a Diesa, which is a multi-band compressor that's one band and is focused just on the top end so that every time there's a s sound, it compresses down and lowers the volume level. And when we talk about sibilance, we generally refer to somewhere between 4Ks and 5Ks. Do you agree, Dom? Yeah, sometimes it can be way higher than that. Sometimes, like, you know, like a DS server goes all the way up to 10K might be might be useful, especially for female vocals that are, like, very, very high. You know, the, the S's are kind of different when they are female vocals than, you know, the male vocals, so... Right. I think that one of the aspects to take into consideration is what kind of sound are we trying to achieve? Because of course, if we, if we want to have like a brighter sound, then we might want to have 
the famous air band. So whatever is on the very top end of the spectrum, we want to lift that. Even if we cannot exactly hear it, like, I don't know, maybe it could be the 20 Ks. I mean, there are some equalizers that have what 40k the air yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah what is yeah. that called the, the maggie q thank you the maggie yeah. q but what that means is that yes you might be touching on the 40ks but what what happens is that uh, you're gently enhancing whatever is below that so a hi-fi sound would have probably some hyped high frequencies and it might mean hey be careful with those s's or other kind of sounds might be a bit more lo-fi so you might not need to make it too bright. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, um, you know, again, it's it's what sound you're going for. But I think, like, you know, the S's are very wide. It, they Sometimes they cover such a wide range of frequencies. Sometimes it might be in the 4, 5K, and, you know, it's very easy to remove. Sometimes it can extend to, like, 10K, 12K sometimes. And I think it's mostly because of the microphone, or, you know, the acoustics of the room, or even, you know, the singer. So sometimes they're really hard to tame. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And um, so as we are talking about compression, we've talked about compression in terms of uh, leveling and, uh, and in terms of giving it a sound. But Aaron, you spoke about parallel compression. What do we use parallel compression for when it comes to vocals? With parallel compression on vocals, um, we tend to compress very, very hard, doing a lot of compression so that the vocal becomes sort of a very solid core. And then we bring the level of that back up inside the main vocal that's not affected. And it helps to support it and fill it out. It gives a nice bed for the more dynamic vocal to sit upon. Yeah, exactly. And when you use parallel compression, pretty much you have a minimum signal level for the vocals that never drops. So even if for a second the singer might be a bit quieter, we always have that super compressed version poking from behind, so you can always hear what she, what she or he is saying, and, and, and that's a great trick. Also, the way I see parallel compression, it's sort of like having a harder core for the vocals, which means you can use that core to make those vocals present all the times. Even when maybe the chorus is coming and the arrangement becomes a little bit more crowded, then you can use the parallel compression to just keep on making the vocals present. And um, do you use that trick, Tom? Oh yeah, also I would like to expand on that because that's a great trick. Most people, they mix the vocals, you know, the verse sounds great, it sounds really nice and smooth, when the chorus comes in and you know all the instruments come in, then the vocals get lost. A very cool trick is instead of trying to automate your vocals, your main vocal track, is to automate the actual parallel. So when the chorus comes in, you automate your parallel track and you make it louder so that you have a more compressed sound. So you have a bigger amount of compression to the sound, but without making the actual dry vocals louder, which are going to be more dynamic, you use your parallel channel as a um, boost for your chorus. So yeah. it's really, really cool trick. It works and it doesn't sound as drastic as, you know, just uh, automating the main vocals because when you do that, you will hear it. If you do it with parallel, it's really, really transparent, but it really works. That's right. So the trick would be ride your vocals using your parallel channel. Now, this is a good occasion for me to talk about don't overkill because you still need those vocals to drive the song. And sometimes the good singers also can deliver the sort of rhythmic um, element to their vocals, which contributes a lot. I mean, listen to James Brown, listen to Michael Jackson, listen to, uh, you know, most modern singers, they, they use that sort of rhythmic element inside their vocals. So if you squash the life and the dynamic out of it, you might be killing it. So as always, compression is great, but you have to use it with great taste. And uh, also I would say, don't be lazy. Try to ride those vocals as well as riding everything else because music is not about 100%, 100%, 100% all the time. You have to create diversity. You have to create contrast. Maybe busy 
and sparse, maybe loud and quiet, maybe uh, saturated and maybe clear. So if you have nice contrasts within the mix, you stand one more chance to catch the attention of your listener. Aaron. Yeah, obviously contrast is very important. You can't have something that's loud all the time won't sound loud. If you have something that's very quiet and then you have something that's louder, it will catch your attention. It makes you sort of jump. It's a natural evolutionary instinct. Great. Mm -hmm. So how about if now we talk about distortion a little bit deeper into it? Dom, what does distortion allow us to do with vocals and when is it too much? (laughs) <laughs> well, distortion is a form of compression, isn't it? It's it, basically it's saturating your your sound so much that it distorts. So if you see like um, the, the easiest example to demonstrate that would be like a distorted guitar. If you see the waveform, it's like a square wave almost. If it's completely distorted, so I mean saturating the vocals is like compressing them but at the same time you're adding more harmonics to the sound so they sound fuller they might sound a bit more aggressive they might sound a bit more you know you might enhance their mid-range again culture vulture comes to mind devilock comes to mind from sound toys it's a plugin that we use a lot and it's great for vocals of course you have to use it in moderation but you know what it allows you to do is you can create different colors with it So you can have, if you feel that your vocals lack a bit of body, you can add some saturation and then you can lift those low mids. And of course, if you do it in parallel, it's very transparent and it's also very, you know, it it lifts the vocals up without necessarily making them louder. Very, very cool trick. I mean, for most pop productions right now, it's very hard to find any production that they don't use distortion on the vocals, even with the slightest amount. That's right. Well, as you're touching on the frequencies, I think it's a good segue if we start talking about EQ. So number one, how do we call every area of the vocals? (laughs) I'll try and give my version. Uh, Okay, I would say below 100, yeah, it's a bit dangerous. I would Mm. tend to remove whatever it's down there. When it comes to the 100, 200, it would be a little bit of the low body of the vocals, and that's where maybe it, you may make it sound a bit more masculine. Mm-hmm. And uh, around 300 is a little bit of the boxiness. Usually mm-hmm. the, the problems that I find there are dependent on the condition it was recorded. So maybe if it's a small room, it's very easy, you know, in that range to get some bad activity. Yeah, yeah. So resonances and stuff. Resonances and stuff like that. So uh, that is a particular area where you have to be careful. And then as you go up to the 500, that starts becoming a little bit more present. You've got your low mids, higher mids, and that gets us all the way to 1K, which is the beginning of our Fletcher Munson curve. So what happens between 1K and 3K, That there we have the whole range of the character of the vocals. And also we have all the character of the microphone and pretty much all of the character of the preamp that we've been using. So between 1K and 3K, you can decide to enhance or to cut and you will shape dramatically your vocals. After that, we start getting into the sibilance area so four five six k's that is an area where we perceive the high fi level of the recording after that we call it air because it's just how airy the the vocal will sound what are your considerations when it comes to frequencies for vocals dom well, I think the first thing you have to take care of when you have a vocal track is to remove what's wrong with it. Uh, so before you even start compressing, with before you even start EQing, adding saturation or anything else, you should take care of the problem. So if a vocal is very boxy, you don't want to enhance that using a compressor. You don't want to compress it before you fix that problem because the compressor will make the problem worse. <laughs> so... You know, if um, a vocal is really boxy, then you, you you try and to cut these annoying frequencies using a surgical EQ, and that's where digital EQs are very good at. They're very good at cutting. Even if it's if it's a good plugin, then it will do the job very well. So we save the analog stuff for the 
you know, for the good portion of the processing, which is like the enhancing and, you know, the character portion of the actual vocal processing. But I would say remove all the, you know, annoying resonances. So maybe maybe you might have some ambience from the room. This should be taken care of. There are many techniques to get rid of this. It's not it's never ideal, but you can use um, D-Reverb plugins or you can use uh, envelope shapers to remove some of these annoying reflections that might have been recorded in a less than ideal room and then you start dealing with you know you know with compression because if you have a very roomy vocal the compressor is going to bring everything up it's going to be a mess you have to take care of this before you even start you know what i'm going to give a little pointer there when you have a certain frequency that annoys you say that it is for a six of argument is 300 all right so you've done your eq you've tried to isolate it and once you have isolated it you're narrowing your eq and you're trying to look for that frequency, you first enhance it to make sure that that's the frequency that annoys you, and then you start pulling it down. Now, if you have identified the problem being 300, chances are that you're going to have to fix also the 600. Yeah, exactly. So, because, you know, that that's how harmonics work. You know, they go up one octave. And so, if, if you're trying to address one problem in one area, try to multiply that frequency by two, or divided by two, and try to see if that problem occurs also on other uh, narrowing uh, harmonics of your frequency. I have another trick. Go ahead. Sometimes you find that some, it, it might not be the room, it might be just the actual vocalist that has this, not problem, but this characteristic on their voice. So basically sometimes you hear a singer, when he's in the low register, he sounds perfect, but when he hits higher notes, he becomes a bit strident and some frequencies really cut through and they can become a bit annoying for example even great vocalists like amy winehouse i think one of their mixers said that she was uh, finding that she had this characteristic not necessarily bad but it was happening so one way to do it is because you don't want to compromise your vocals when they are in the good range and they sound great when they hit these these notes you can use like a multi-band not a, not even a multi-band i would say a dynamic eq so when these frequencies are ringing or they are become too loud, this will cut them, but only when they hit. So you don't have to compromise the, you know, the soft sound or the, the, you know, the lower notes, which don't exhibit that problem. Or it can be the other way around. Maybe a singer is very boxy in the low, when he goes low and he's fine when he's up. Um, you know, you just... Um, Find the frequency that annoys you in the low registers, and then this won't be attenuated when, you, when, he, when he goes up. It really works, really works well. I have to say, this is a very typical problem for singers in general. I mean, some singers make a conscious decision on having like a little nasal voice. Of course, you know, ever since um, Billie Holiday and uh, of course Amy Winehouse, there is this sort of modern uh, approach to singing, which I have to go a little mm. bit like this. Yeah. And that of course comes with a, <laughs> with a price to pay is that you have to take care of those middle frequencies. And what you mentioned there is it's right on the money. Now, Dom, can you please explain to us exactly what's the difference between multiband compression and dynamic equalization? Well, it always depends on the plugin uh, or, you know, the specific processor. But in general, a multiband compressor deals with the range of frequencies. So you can't have like very specific frequencies and process those it will introduce artifacts. Most of the time it can be, okay, I will deal with um, um, higher mids, so it can be from 1K to 5K, and it's a range. But with an EQ, you can be very tight, you can be as narrow as an EQ, have a very you know sharp Q, and just compress those frequencies. So when those frequencies go after a certain point, after a certain threshold, then you know it attenuates them. On the multiband compressor, it's a range of frequencies. It works the same way, but it's less specific. I think that's the main difference. That's actually a very good explanation. So, yes, in other words, a multiband compressor will divide, say, in three frequencies, from 0 to 200, from 200 to 600, from uh, 600 to uh, 5Ks. 
So anytime the level there gets too loud, it compresses the whole range. Where a dynamic EQ, we will just identify when a certain frequency pokes out a little bit too much and it will apply a predetermined EQ curve to that frequency. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> All right. We are already running out of time. I can feel that. But there are a few more things that I want to talk about and that's how to make the vocals more assertive. And um, when I say assertive, I use it in a way which is quite expanded. For me, assertive is a combination of being on time or being purposely late or purposely early and uh, being in tune so that when I hit a certain note, I can really make a statement for that note. So if I want to be a little bit flat before, but then on the important notes where I land, I demonstrate my capacity as a singer hitting that note perfectly, that will make my vocals more assertive. Of course, it also has to do with the pronunciation, with the message that you are delivering in terms of words. But there are ways to improve that assertiveness, and that is editing. We all call it autotune, but the truth is that now all programs do it differently, from Melodyne to Cubase. Each company has its own way of doing it. The thing is to manually go after notes that are not exactly on the money, and not doing this just blindly. I am going to make this all pitch perfect, because that's gonna be boring and that's gonna sound bad, the trick is to identify the notes that are going to say, hey, I really know what I'm doing, so I'm going to hit this note right precisely there. And with rap, editing applies in, in a very different way. A lot of rap is supposed to be a little bit laid back, and it defines a certain coolness to be a little bit laid back. But at the same time, when the chorus hits on the beat number one, Maybe you want to make sure that you hit that bit exactly dead center because that is going to give you more purpose and it's going to make you more assertive. So yes, I may be a little bit laid back before, but when it comes to the important time where I need to go ta 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 I narrow the click and I just hit it completely dead center. So alternating this natural flow and being very precise makes the vocals more assertive in my opinion. What do you think, Tom? You know, like, it's part of, you know, the actual art of singing, right? So, I mean, the better the performance, the better the results that you're gonna get. And of course, editing can help a lot, like uh, rhythm editing, you know, can help with uh, hip-hop vocals, as you said. I think it's, you know, the tuning should be a creative process and the actual, you know, tweaking of the vocals should be more on the creative side rather than the fixing side. But that's rarely the case. <laughs> because singers know that you can fix them and uh, and they just lay back and say, cool, you'll fix that, all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're getting a bit lazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, performance is everything. I mean, in every aspect of, of uh, music making. And may I say, it's after releasing as well. Because, you know, your communication, the way you portray the music that you are making, the way you market it, uh, the way you communicate. I don't like the word marketing for music. Let's say the way you communicate it is a performance as well. So when you've finished mixing, when you've finished mastering, your job isn't finished. It's actually, <laughs> it's just starting. So that's a little tip for our independent artists across the world. Having said that, let's Go to Q&A time. Q&A time. Hey Aaron, what we got? Okay, our first question comes from Job, who asks, on vocals, actually it's a good question for this week. I heard a lot of sound engineers use an 1176 along with an LA2A to treat voice. It would be nice to see some awesome tutorials. Cheers. Who? I think we should do it. Well, actually, you can look at our um, YouTube channel and we do demonstrate not only the 1176, an original U-Ray LA-2A, uh, we also demonstrate the Distressor, we demonstrate the Fat Bastard and how it can 
help with you know its uh, attitude knob, which makes the things a little bit more distorted and more present. The and Fairchild as well. The Fairchild, yeah, the AT101. It's a modern version of the Fairchild. Um, you should look that up. It's called Analog Tube AT101. You can just go on the YouTube channel and you will find all of that information. We will do more tutorials about techniques. Stay tuned. We have some good plans, haven't we? <laughs> we do. Our second question comes from Biggs Hansen, who asks, when is it necessary to use auxiliary tracks to treat your audio as opposed to treating your tracks directly on the source? I would mm. say dumb. You can answer that. Well, it's, uh, you know, when you don't want to, when, when you have a very good material, you don't want to spoil it. <laughs> so, you know, you just want to keep it as it is and you want to enhance it, but you want to enhance it, you know, in a non-destructive way, but in an um, additive way, I would say. So instead of taking away the dynamics of a vocal, for example, you know, you have a very nice performance and you don't want to sacrifice all the dynamics and the rhythm like, you, you know, you were saying, Claudio, you just add the compressed signal as an auxiliary channel and, you know, you just blend it in and you still have the dynamic vocal and you have your compressed vocal or you, have, you might have your saturated vocal. So you don't sacrifice, you just blend things in. So I think for that thing, you know, it's really, it pays off to use auxiliary channels. That's a great way of saying it. If, if you use effects on the channel, it's like using subtractive synthesis. If you do it on auxiliary tracks, it's like doing additive synthesis. That's a great <laughs> metaphor for it. Cool. All right, let's hit the next one. And our third question, which actually touches on a... Um point that we haven't talked about with vocals and i'm pretty sure we're gonna have to do a part two right guys mm. yes right it's reverb nah it's not reverb no. <laughs> pierre jameson jr asks if you mix harmony vocals do you guys have a tendency to pan them hard left or right or slightly pan them or do you leave them dead center and he says p.s i love when you guys do hardware videos in action all right, yeah. thank you so much. Um, okay, firstly, we never have enough time to speak about things. We were tempted of doing a bass part two, but we didn't because otherwise we don't want to stay too long on the same subject, but we're going to go back to it. And in fact, this episode is not enough for vocals. We will have to talk about reverbs. We have to talk about BVs. Just quickly on the BVs. Yes, I like personally to make them nice and wide and I can use wideners and I can remove the mono information if I want to hype that wide aspect of it. I think it's a nice idea and uh, it pulls the vocals out of the way because of course the backing vocals are, you know, they have a lot of mid information because they're vocals. A nice way is to put them on the side and also another way, if you can't put them too far from the center, then you might want to, you know, dig a little hole there in the mids so that you can still feel the harmony, but you won't take space from the lead vocals. We have to do a, a, a whole episode about yeah. it. Yeah, I would definitely expand on that and say, if you want to be adventurous, you can still have your, you know, your lead vocals, and then you can have your backing vocals, and your backing vocals, the mid portion of the backing vocals can be side-chained to the lead vocal. <laughs> 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 so basically, you know, when, when, when the lead vocal hits, just the mid gets compressed, and the sides are there to do their job, and it sounds really wide. So, okay, so you're talking about mid-side mid -side treatment here. Yeah. So basically you're saying we take the mids information of the backing vocals and we just dock the middle frequencies yes. of the mids. Yes. <laughs> I didn't use that yeah. trick before. That's very, it's very good. It's very clever. Yeah. You, you need, of course, you need very, very, very advanced processors to do that. There are very few processes that can do that. But if you do it right, it, it sounds great. Yeah, yeah. You can duck the mids. You can duck the mids in the mono. You can do... That's great. Yeah, it's I'm going to try that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. Do we have another one? Yeah, we'll do, we'll do one more. Uh, this one comes from me. And it's... Yeah, cool. I'm going cool. right. to butt in here. I'm going to say, what's your favorite album at the moment? Oh, 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 oh. oh I love I like this time. 
Dumb, you cannot take the iPad. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> Put the iPad down. Put now. the iPad down. All right. I, I <laughs> you go first. Of course, you, you know, you got, I got Quincy, Quincy Jones, Jones from you yeah, last week. So now you can go. <laughs> All right. Um, my favorite album ever. I oh, think ever or at the moment? At the oh, moment. no, you said at the moment. Okay, at the moment, uh, that would be... It's it's not an album, it's a track. It's a track from Louis Vega. And can't remember what it's called. I think Elevator <laughs> Up and Down thing. <laughs> 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 and I love, 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 love the verse. And actually, up until the middle eight, I love every bit of it. After the middle eight, uh, I'm not so sure. But... I get fixated with one track at a time lately, uh, and uh, so Louis Vega, that, that's my favorite track for now. While Dom is still searching, <laughs> cheating, clearly. <laughs> because I much. don't have time to listen to music. It's true. That's true. That's actually a very important part. That's a very important mm. part. I mean, we, as we work a lot with music, we don't get too much time to listen to music. Yeah. So we have to kind of fight for a time to listen to your yeah. music. So when you fight and you find time, what is that, Dom? And also when you, you do find the time, you get like, ah, ah, interesting way of mixing this track. Hmm, I would have done it differently. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not sure about that. You know, so... Yeah, yeah. You, you, you dissect and yeah. you overanalyze things instead of enjoying it. I know the feeling. The album that I'm listening to right now is, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the latest album from Lana Del Rey. And I think it's very well done it uh, has very nice orchestration it has a very it has lots of character if, even if it's like a pop album the songs are not so pop anymore and uh, i really like the way they've mixed it it's very it's kind of dark and round it's almost like it's mixed on tape i'm sure it's not but even if it is it doesn't matter because it has a very it's not too bright it has nice mid range and also the orchestrations are very nice and the tracks are very cool so i have i think they have a very vo good vocal sound as well very uh, the, the reavers blend very well see i'm dissecting it you're so, dissecting it again i was about, about to it, say no. it. <laughs> all right aaron have you got one favorite now currently i am really into the salesin self-titled album which came out I don't know, like 10 years ago maybe but they've uh, just announced that they've reunited with their original vocalist who was the best and they're going to come to the UK and play so I'm hyped on that and I'm listening to that on repeat well, they're going to play in London right? yeah they're going to play uh, over in Islington are you going to go? of course I'm going to go <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well if you want to know more about our mixing mastering production services please visit us on drmix.com subscribe to this podcast go and watch our YouTube channel there is so much nice information on it as always please feel free to send us your questions to questions at drmix.com. And as always, thanks for listening to this podcast and see you next week.